vlog day 7, September 25th, 2006. Last night we left from Salt Lake City, Utah, and we're now heading to Reno. And um, I have to say that my favorite part of this trip was driving through Wyoming, uh, the eastern part of Wyoming, before you get into the Rockies, because the hills are rolling and they're beautiful and there's not a lot of shrubbery. It, it kind of reminds me of what I think Ireland would look like, although I'm, I'm sure that I'm completely wrong. We even saw antelope. It was great. So anyway, we're going to um, keep on going with our story of Grandpa's life. So let me switch it over to him. But first, why don't you take a little look. This is what we're looking at now as the scenery. Desolate. Not much to look at, that's for sure. Hey. Hi. <laughs> well, welcome to our seventh day of travel now, and it and it 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 is something that we don't normally think about, especially living in, in on the eastern part of the U.S. But so much of the U.S., a lot of the U.S. is it's it's not barren, but it's empty of people. And I think Rachel and I have gone when we get through today, we'll have traveled over two thousand miles where it's almost nothing as far as habit, as far as uh, having people uh, uh, living there. It's, it's really strange, it's very, very beautiful. We've seen many things, everything from, from herd of antelope to, to, to hundreds of seeing five or six antelope at a time. And even seeing some strange little animals as, as uh, Rachel just saw one run across the road. So it's been fascinating, it's thoroughly, it's thoroughly beautiful really enjoyed it. Now, we'll go back to, as I finish up my my Air Force uh, career, an Air Force tour, I was down at, um, at uh, uh, headquarters uh, 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 of U.S. European Forces, uh, U.S. UCOM, European Command, uh, down in Stuttgart, just south of Stuttgart, Germany, Patch Barracks. This is the headquarters for all U.S. forces. And while General Haig was the commander of NATO, he was also commander of U.S. forces. So he, in essence, was uh, was my commander. I worked for an admiral, a two-star admiral, who worked for for Haig, uh, but also General Dutch Heise, it was Haig's uh, was Haig's vice chief, and and so Dutch Heise we saw almost all the time. Interesting things. Dutch Heise was the one that was sent by the president to go tell the Shah of Iran that he had to leave uh, Iran. And when he did, he said, uh, when the Dutch went down to Tehran to, to tell him that, he said he knew that he was writing, uh, in essence, he knew that the generals and admirals that he knew, you know, comparable rank in Iran, uh, who, who, if they stayed there, would be killed because the, the revolutionary forces and every pull on. Being at Patch Barracks, uh, just south of Stuttgart, at the European Command Headquarters, uh, my job there was I was uh, chief of operation of all operational communications for Europe. This is what they call non non defense communication uh, communications. I had uh, for all the weapon systems that tied everything together throughout Europe that all, that all belonged, what I was responsible for all of them. And, um, and uh, I worked for Admiral Bill Nivison, and I'll tell you about working for, for Dutch, uh, Dutch Heiser and, and Alexander Haig. Had a bunch of interesting, interesting trips there. Uh, I was trying to think of with the girls. Now the girls had started to go back by this time. Uh, uh, Sandy was there, and, and, and she finished up high school. She did. In fact, she f she finished a half year early, uh, so she graduated in February. Uh, Diane was going back, and Kathy had gone back. Uh, back to where? Back back uh, along the Gulf Coast. That, that's where everybody went. Uh, was going back. Uh, Sandy was going to school. The girls had gone to school, Kathy and Diane had gone to school at, at, at the University down in Seville, of Seville. And uh, they thoroughly enjoyed it. They got to see their grandfather, um, 
almost by surprise as he's tooling through uh, Seville. With, Which with grandfather? It. This was Grandfather Charlie, Grandpa Charlie. And he was a, some, somewhat of a character. Uh, he, he, lived, he lived in Europe, he, he went to Europe, lived in Europe and had a, had a, had a motorbike uh, or a, uh, a Sony. And so I should ask, but it was but but supposed to be a, like a, a 50cc motorcycle. And he had everything piled on it, including from time to time uh, his girlfriends. Yeah, he, um, <laughs> when he came down to Spain, the girl spotted him going through town with a girlfriend on the back of his motorbike, motorcycle. And they, and they, they yelled up, looked up and said, hey, Grandpa. Well, needless to say, Charlie was embarrassed to tears because here's two uh, teenagers uh, going to school yelling Grandpa to him. Well, he, he lived around Sevilla, Sevilla for a while and he also lived over in, uh, oh, goodness gracious. I can't think of them, but another uh, Spanish, a large Spanish city that had caves right outside the city. And Charlie lived in a cave, in the caves, and uh, fixed up electricity and everything else. That was, that was Charlie. He enjoyed every minute. He'd also come up to, when we were living in Germany, he came up and lived near us in Germany. Um, and what do you do? He would trade like an apartment for translation services and things like that. He was an excellent linguist. Just very briefly, in Grandpa Charlie, uh, he was a um, he was one of the six teachers that led. Well, he was one of the teachers that led the first uh, statewide walkout, and this was in Florida, uh, way back when. And he was one of the six teachers invited not to teach in Florida again. So they put him out on pension. Initially, $150 a month, and later became close to $200, $250 a month. But that was his pension. They lived on it, and he did. Well, getting back to uh, to Spain, the girls are going to, Kathy and, D and Diane are going to school in Spain for a semester. And uh, one of the little vignettes on it was Diane, and Kathy had flown, it was for Christmas time, when they, when they went down to school, Christmas, Kathy flew up. Diane decided to stay there a couple of days later, except I didn't know where she was, and I panicked. I got the Air Force looking for her. And they had everybody working together. And uh, somehow, we, maybe Diane did get a hold of She was on a train going to Madrid from Seville. So I made sure that I was down in Spain and Air Force fixed me up, put me on the next flight out, flew me down to Spain. And I was, uh, waiting, at, I was waiting at the train station for Diane when it, when it arrived from Seville. And then we tooled around, I think we tooled around Madrid for a day or so, and then, then we flew up to, uh, up to uh, Germany. Let's see, and then that was just a little, one little other vignette. We, uh, we packed it up, but as, as I'm getting, I, I put in the papers, uh, I, I, I knew your grandmother Anne uh, had had enough of, 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 of Air Force. And military. And I put in, uh, and I couldn't accept the, the command assignment they wanted to take. Uh, so I put him in my retirement papers. Admiral Bill Nemison says, and he, was very, he said, Richard, you better look at this. I said, and he tells me, I thought you were on fast, fast track to be general officer. That's the first time I'd heard that, but uh, I knew my reports were good. But I said, well, no, we'd made the decision. And, go with it. Well, something came along that would change it. Uh, they decided to have a, uh, uh, decided to have a, a, a large-scale exercise. In fact, there's 35,000 uh, members of all the services were involved in this exercise called Price X-79, where it brought the Spanish and U.S. forces together to help teach the Spanish forces how to work together and how to prepare to join NATO. And uh, so I was asked if I would volunteer to go down, and my boss would be a, 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 a bird colonel who had just made his first star, Admiral, uh, I mean, General John Galvin, Brigadier General John Galvin. And, and I said, okay, I'm going to extend for that and, and, and go on down. And uh, uh, so uh, we, we drove, uh, you know, 
Grandma Ann and I drove down. And I extended for Spain for the duration of the exercise, which would be about, from the time I left Stuttgart, about nine months. But six months past the date that I wanted to retire. But I went down with the, uh, we, we drove down and, and lived in a fantastic apartment. But now one of the things, Sandy heard that we were going to go to Spain, so she lets me know, says, Dad, I'm coming, you're going to Spain, I'm coming, up, coming back from the States to join you. So she came over, and we just had, we had a thoroughly enjoyable time. I may have mentioned this earlier in the tape, we had a thoroughly enjoyable time. Sandy and I, uh, Ann didn't come with us, but Sandy and I went to a bullfight. And Sandy, who at first was reluctant to bullfight, but at the end was critiquing the sports writers on how you're supposed to do a bullfight and how you're supposed to write about a bullfight. So, uh, so even then she was, she was sort of well into communication. But she did real well. She enjoyed Madrid, enjoyed Spain. We went to, um, uh, at the officers club, some parties by General Galvin and, and for the whole staff of, 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 of the, the high command staff of Christ X-79. Uh, one little vignette, I became the commander of 35,000 troops on paper. It was in the month of August of 1979 in Madrid, and General Galvin left to go back up to Germany so he could be with his family for at least three weeks of August. Uh, general Saavedra, who was the Spanish general in charge of the exercise, he went down, he was actually, his family was in the Sevilla, Seville area of Spain. I'm up in Madrid almost by myself, but, but on paper I, I controlled 35,000 forces. The, my second command, another vignette, my second command was a General Alvarez, one-star general, Spanish, who at that time was, was almost 65 years old. Now here's a general, he's, a, he's, he's, he, he's over 20 years older than I am, but yet because of positions, he works for me. Well, General Alvarez was to make news later, and I think in, a, in the wrong way it wasn't accurate. But, uh, they accused, there was a plot, and I don't know if you can, if you remember back, you saw the people going and shooting up Parliament, and I don't know if anyone ever got killed in it, but it was, was uh, shooting up Parliament, tried, tried to take over from the king, because they, they, they didn't think that, the plotters didn't think that Juan Carlos, King Carlos, was, was doing the right thing. Uh, he wasn't following uh, uh, the former dictators, dictates. And they had, they had grown up under the dictator. Uh, uh, anyway, so, uh, and I can't think of it, the dictator's name, but so well known, uh, Franco. Franco was the dictator. And he had died, and the king, of course, was leading a, a democratic path, one of the democratic paths for Spain. So he, anyway, the general who worked for him was later accused of being one of the plotters for overthrowing the king. I think he was, I think he was later exonerated. I didn't think that the gentleman could do something like that. Some of the other people that, that worked for me, I, I knew could because uh, they were just displeased with the king. And well, I'll dispense with those names. Um, but we had the exercise in Spain. It went over real well. Uh, it, 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 uh, it accomplished its purpose. Spain entered NATO uh, as a full-fledged member and uh, was a few years later. And in part because of some of the things that we did to show that yes, you can work together, you can work with other countries, and you can do it jointly. So then I went back to uh, your mother, or I'm talking about Kathy Ann and Sandy. Ann went, ba Ann went back with Sandy to the States. And Sandy went uh, back, I believe, back into school then. Uh, what school? I, the, uh, she was going to Mississippi. I think, if I'm not mistaken, was it Mississippi College for Women, uh, up, up, well north of Jackson. But I think that's. I think it, it may have, may have had another, probably does it did have another name. I think I don't think the Mississippi College for Women lasted too long, or much longer. It was the old. It was one of the original colleges, one of the original colleges for women in the U.S. and one of the original colleges in, in uh, Mississippi. Wow. So that's why she went and finished school in communications. So I, I went until, I, uh, and I was released from my, my tour, in Spain, uh, tour in Spain 
when the exercise was over, which was the late latter part of November, and I went back and uh, and was discharged at Charleston Air Force Base, South Carolina, on December 1st, uh, 1979. So that was that was my military that was my military career as such. I w <laughs> like a lot of military people. I uh, I uh, figured trying to figure out what to do. At first, we, we lived in, a, in an apartment. When I got back, lived in an apartment uh, in past I think past Christian Isles. I've forgotten the name of it now. But we're looking for a house to buy, and I was mean, thinking what to do. I said, well, to try real estate because uh, I saw other military people had gotten into it. So I went to school up in Jackson. Was sponsored by this the little general. I was the name of the real estate agency, and but I got into real estate. And I made all the headlines for being uh, number one, but it, uh, it could be number one, but I didn't see the money uh, there at all that I was expecting. I was in it for about a year, was not pleased. I didn't like working with bankers. I didn't like working with other real estate people. And I didn't like working with, uh, especially the, the home loan people, uh, a bunch of screwballs, <laughs> and to my way of thinking. And then I got, you know, here somebody's always looking out for me. I got a knock on the door. It was actually a next door neighbor that I hadn't met, and I can't think of his name right now. But uh, Bobby Hammond was his name. He, he lived in a house, big house behind us, and we just had not had a reason to meet. But he knocked on the door. He said he knew he he knew that I was a retired military, retired colonel, and he worked out at NASA, at the National Space Technology Labs, and they needed they needed management expertise. Uh, through a lot of their program and felt as a, as, a, as a retired colonel I'd be able to provide that. So I said, man, I've been waiting for something like this because uh, I, I really can't stand what I'm doing now, which is real estate. No matter how well they think I'm doing it, I didn't think I was doing good and I didn't like it. So I went out and was hired right away and, and told to come back in the first week of January. By this time, it's been a year so it's the first week of January, 1981, and that's where uh, see, I'm up here. that's where uh, I, I had to, uh, so that's why the, I was the, the speaking. Turn it off for, for okay. The, the, the I went. Yeah, yeah. At, okay, I started work. I got the job at, at NASA right away, and, and uh, it was and I was chief of programs. Of doing I didn't, what? And now, what, what what did NASA assign me to, to Army? And uh, because Army needed, uh, really needed help uh, in their new pro the programs that were uh, to bring to bring life back to the chemical and biological protection program, which had stagnated for the previous ten years. And this happened. The stagnation came from President Nixon. And even though people take shots, he actually tried to get rid of. Uh, the biological weapons especially, and he cut out all uh, development in bio, I mean, cut it uh, immediately. Uh, Fort Detrick almost closed down, it was a, almost a caretaker, caretaker organization was taking care of, that was the bio side. The chemical side, we, we already knew that chemicals did not serve a purpose, you know. Uh, none, none of the commanders ever wanted to use chemicals. The only ones who ever advocated use were chemical officers, you know, and that, and that, and, and, and then chemical officers are not operational officers. So uh, it just we built a bunch of stock, and it wasn't. It was not going to be used. I doubt any commander ever would have authorized the use of chemicals within their theater that they were they were responsible for. But anyway, so I'm going up to help rejuvenate some of the programs, and um, uh, and, and things were were going fair with with Anna and myself, except the drinking, which which I'm I'm very slow to even recognize as a problem. But it is a very you know we talked a little bit about what she had <laughs> the guy wanted to interview me for a job. From Computer Science Corporation in Washington, when Anne just was, you know, she started talking in a, in a different tongue. You could not understand it, but 
she did not look like she even had a drink and, she, and she's doing that well it's getting worse and the smoking was getting heavier and I, I and I begged and played no more smoking I by this time I'd quit smoking for uh, well over 10 years or 15 years or whatever it was 10 years anyway and uh, and I just felt that, that you know it wasn't good for the family well okay now I'm working at NASA and they're sending me up to <laughs> to, to uh, uh, Aberdeen Proving Ground, which is which is where we just left to start this trip. They sent me up there to help them with their program. And actually the management part, it's the same no matter what literally no matter what you're doing. But I was able to to to, to help them get guidance on what did they need, how could they do it, when should they do it, what it was gonna cost them. The very first job Army had me do after being in essence assigned to them through NASA and actually through Computer Science Corporation, who was under contract with NASA. And um, uh, the first program was, was to, to interview, get data from uh, every program manager, every system manager within the Army that had a system that should be protected. Of course, I I'd go into various offices around the U.S. of a system manager, a program manager, and tell them they now had to add $25,000 of equipment to each of their systems, and they could have 300 systems. Uh, I think a few of them even threatened me to throw, throw me out of the third floor window of their office or something, because that's all they needed with me or something like that. But at the end of this first program, which was called the MCPE, the Modulated Modular Collective Protection Equipment Program. I did that, and the general at Aberdeen wrote across it, this is our guidance for the future. That's a, it was a program that I had done for NASA. Well, this lady working in the office next to me, and this actually happened, it was on that first day I reported in to duty. I walked and walked in their office. I had a pipe. Now I had started smoking a pipe and uh, had meerschaum and all these kind of. And once I'd started actually in Germany smoking a pipe, I had all kind of pipes from going to Turkey twice a month and getting the meerschaum pipes. So I had a whole bunch of them. I walked in this office. The, so help me, the very first words said, "This is from Barbara." Now Barbara Price, or get out of my office in rather loud voice. And that was the first word. And what it was, because right over our head was a sign, which I didn't see when I walked in the sign says, no smoking. So I'm walking, Joe Cool with his pipe. She said later she had heard this old colonel, another old colonel was walking around looking for a job. You know, NASA. <laughs> and then I thought, of course I'd already had the job, but not in my office was next door. We started making trips together, and, and, and you know, as happens, and we found we had a lot in common. Well, three and a half years later, uh, we were married and uh, started started a new life. So wait, when in all this? Okay, never mind. What? Uh, uh, well, in, in the interim period that we uh, uh, I'd had uh, was going up. Um, one of the things we found that, that there was so much we didn't know about uh, chemical and biological protection and that, and that Europe did know. So we recommended to the Army that they send someone to Europe. And of course, they go to all these things. And they said, well, they didn't have anyone to send. Uh, why don't we go? So I went with Barbara, took Barbara up to Washington. We had to set up appointments with seven embassy in Washington, the last one being a German embassy. What we wanted to do was go and be briefed by their people on what equipment they were developing. Now this, of course, has gotten the classified areas at that time. Probably none of it's classified now, but it's all classified then. And we didn't know how it would be, or in fact, why the Army didn't want to do it. They didn't know how they would be received, asking other countries what they're doing. Plus, the Army is always reluctant to say anyone can do anything better than them anyway. And, and especially Aberdeen had the NI, NIH syndrome, not invented here syndrome, really, really bad. 
So, uh, anyway, we went to these embassies, and the, every embassy, bar none, every embassy said, oh, we're so glad to see you. It's about time, we thought it was about time the Americans found out what the rest of the world was doing in this area. So I hit the two of us. So, we go to the, the last embassy, the German embassy, before we went to get a cab over the National Airport at that time, and go back to New Orleans and back to NASA. Well, we called the German embassy, and the number two man in the embassy interviewed us. They asked why we wouldn't go, so we told him. He thought it was really neat that we'd be able to ask don't worry, we'll take care of everything. So we left. All we had to do was get a cab. We had to wait a little bit for a cab. Get a cab to the National Airport. We get to the National Airport, and we were met by NASA officials. They'd come over, it had been long enough, they actually stopped the airplane. Uh, before it pulled back from the gate and started the investigation. It was, what were we doing working in the area of chemical and biological? And what we didn't know, and NASA, National Space Technology Laboratory, didn't know, was by charter, original charter, somebody had put a sentence in there that NASA could not work on chemical and biological weapons or anything to do with chemical and biological weapons. Nothing, zero. Purely a civilian agency. So here was NASA had assigned us to the Army because the Army was paying NASA quite heavily per hour for us, which helped pay the light bills, and they thought they were doing a good job, you know, lending expertise to Army. Well, the investigation was over with what could have filled three rooms with the paperwork, but luckily, what we had done, Barbara and I had done, we documented everything we did for Army. And we'd send it to, uh, through channels to NASA headquarters. But typical headquarters, when they see a paper they don't understand, they'd file it. And, but we were able to show that we never did one thing without informing NASA that this was Army wanted to do, and this is what we were doing. And they said, well, about the trip, we just planned this trip for Europe. This is one of the strange things, and this stays on the tape. But uh, NASA disassociated themselves either two or th from us for either two or three weeks. We got paid by. Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah. We got we got we got we got paid by uh, some organization. Oh, Price. In fact, the name of the organization or the company was Price. I think like Price Concrete in Dayton, Ohio. Wow. <laughs> yeah, they paid us. We later were have contract with Price as we're building. Many a couple of years later, we're building uh, uh, shelters in Europe, and Price Concrete was doing a lot of the uh, the work that we had to subcontract out. Or, or the Air Force and the Army had to subcontract out. It was Price Concrete, but they paid us for the time that we were in Europe. It's strange and exotic, but. Uh, but that's the way they had to do things, and then tell us that, uh, hey, yeah, we're going to back off a little bit from, from this help we give because we're not supposed to do it. Well, we saw the handwriting on the wall then, and then on July the 1st, 1983, we had Lionel drop the papers, and we incorporated applied science and analysis. Now, we weren't going to work applied science analysis, but we just wanted the name. But in, in December of 83 or January of 84, February 84, somewhere in there, we decided that, well, we're going to leave NASA and, and Computer Science Corporation because it, it, uh, uh, we knew that the, our days were numbered and we felt what we were doing was too important and people, uh, not Army, Navy, all of them were dependent on results of what we were doing. So we activated applied science and analysis, and and in fact Kathy and Diane and Bill Bill uh, Browse uh, worked for us. Okay, we, we need to we need to pause it. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Bye. Okay, so it's 1984. You've gone on your own with your business. You are currently married to Barbara and. Right, and so we started as a one of our. Uh, our first benefactors was Paul Corporation, who liked us, 
and uh, uh, in essence, they, they, they paid for the business to get started. We uh, did a lot of work. We, we spent one week a month just about down in San Antonio, which was always fun. And, uh, and at one time, uh, Diane had gone with us. And, we're, and then from there, from San Antonio, we went down to Mexico. And she got, I think she bought like 12 Mexican blankets. Uh, and was Aunt Diane married at this time? I'm sorry? Was Aunt Diane married at this time? Was Aunt... Was she married? Was she married? Diane? Oh yeah, yeah. Diane, Diane was married at this time. Okay. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, but she bought, she bought 12 blankets. And, uh, and that, that, that was just neat. Uh, the bit, we, we went along and, uh, uh, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just sort of watching some of the traffic right oh, now. I'm on okay. one lane road at, at this peak, which has to be up around 8,000 feet. And, uh, uh, the, the bit, but actually we're getting, we're getting a good name, but we're not, we're not getting any really big contracts. That would you know to sustain the business, and we we had to be honest. Neither either Barb and I were uh, technically Barb and, and chemistry and me uh, uh, and, and management. There's, there's nothing we couldn't get done for people, except we didn't know how to charge people. We didn't know what to charge. Uh, we um, and and then we got this um, it was offering this part with with uh, Evan Costello was a friend of ours, had, had been talking with, with the penthouse and how the, they should have a magazine devoted to chemical and biological. Well, they made us an offer in which we accepted something different and, and then we moved Kit and Caboodle up, 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 up to New York. Uh, we lived, we, we first went there, we lived in the apartment of the Betty, no, not Betty Gray, Judy Garland's very first apartment, oh. just off of, uh, uh, and this was given, this was given to, lent to us uh, by by penthouse, and uh, so we lived in that. And all I can say is that uh, it had to be a first apartment because I didn't think too much of the apartment at all. I thought it was a fire trap, and we were going we to get roasted alive in that damn thing. So how did you become acquaintances with Evan Coslo? Well, this is over the years back back when we were working ASA. In fact, we probably met him even when we were working for NASA. But but he was interested in this area of the business and of course in filters, filtration, mm -hmm. which is all chemical protection. Mm -hmm. So we met him at several several at uh, several events and several oh, okay. meetings that we were at. And so we knew him very well mm -hmm. uh, by the time he had talked to us about going up to uh, uh, going up to, to New York to work at, at Penthouse. Now what would you be doing at Penthouse? We were, Barbara and I were both the, uh, the executive editors for the, for the magazine. Uh, defense? Yeah, it was Chemical and bio, Biological Defense and Technology. Chemical and, biology, chemical and Biological Technology Defense International. It was a long, long name. We had doubts of its survivability because you, you, couldn't, you couldn't get people at that time to say anything that they'd, they'll tell you they're working on nuclear weapon, but they would not tell you they're working in the era of chemical and biological, because it's such a it's something that the U.S. public just has never bought off on, either chemical and biological weapons. Just a, you know, and that's why I said before, no operational commander's right mind would ever authorize the use of chemical weapons. They go blow them apart first, and, uh, or blow the enemy apart. They're not going to worry about using chemical weapons to do. But, uh, but that's the problem with him, and that, that proved to be later true. Uh, I think the, the magazine lasts about a year, and that included putting it together. Now, we had moved up there on the contract to Penthouse, and as a, at, the, at the very end, we left Penthouse uh, and, and because we thought that it was purely a breach of contract on the part of, of Penthouse magazine. And uh, we brought suit against Penthouse. Now, one of the things we had done, we after we lived in the apartment, uh, 
Judy Garland's first apartment. We, we moved up to Bruce in New York. We bought a house up there. Actually, it was a very nice ranch style house. It had a lot of pro had a lot of ground to it. And when was this? Hmm? When was this? This had to be in. Oh goodness, I'm guessing now in 1986 uh, time frame that that we we moved up there and, and thoroughly enjoyed it. From Brewster, we're commuting on on the on the commuter train every day uh, down to down to Manhattan because we work right on Broadway, uh, uh, right next to Lincoln Center was was Penthouse Magazine, and that was that that was fun. Except we weren't getting all, you know it it they didn't understand us. We didn't understand them. We refused things to go into them into the magazine they felt would help sell the magazine but we thought scientifically technically it just wasn't accurate as it should be so that's when we parted company we brought a breach of contract suit against the penthouse for five million dollars for them wanting to put stuff in and you well, not wanting no, no it was just a whole bunch of it was a whole bunch of different things you know I, I couldn't list them all but it was a whole bunch of lists we had them all listed in the, in the suit and and we we went and there's some organization in New York that recommends lawyers. Well, I recommended a lawyer, also on Broadway, or Broadway Fifth, whatever his feet he was on. We go to see him. And say, oh yeah, you got a good case and everything else. And we paid an upfront fee. Well, we finally got the bill got to be about five thousand dollars, and we weren't going anywhere with a suit. And one thing is that penthouse had 52 lawyers on their staff, something like that. And and it just us, we had this one lawyer who, who was doing work in Russia, could very, very part-time. Then we found out later he had two of his students, because he was also a professor, two of his law students uh, had graduated and were working for Penthouse. You know, so we felt the things were sort of stacked and we'd never get anything out of it. So it finally came to it with a handwritten offer from Penhoff that we, that supposedly was from this judge. And there's a crock, it wasn't from the judge. But anyway, we saw the handwriting. There's no way in the world we can win that suit. We'll just break ourselves paying this guy. So, so I think the suit, it was like for, for 5000 or $5,200. So we paid the guy what we owed him. Washed our hands with the suit. And that was, that was us in New York. I mean, as far as us, you know, we, we then, uh, and I think there's some parts I'm, I'm, I'm missing, but I, I can't remember just what they are right now. But uh, Barbara, I think we may have even gone back down to uh, to Slidell, uh, out, out to the house that we own there, the condo. But we went, we moved, Oh, that's what it was. Yeah, we. By the time we moved to, how was it? We moved to Brewster, New York, and uh, then Barbara. Barbara was when when we're no longer working at penthouse. Barbara, to bring money, put money on the table, was working for a uh, environmental firm that was over at the same place where the where the New York Jets play football in in uh, New, New Jersey. Jersey? In New Jersey. So Barbara, so she was making a 75 mile an hour, a 75 mile commute each way, each day, 150 miles Jeez. commute, and she's doing every day, and through all that New York traffic, you know. So she did that for I don't know six or eight months. Bless her heart, you know, really came through, and, and, and we needed it real bad. In the meantime, I'm keeping up ASA. I'm still doing worldwide travel for ASA. Uh, we're, we're breaking even, maybe making just a little bit on that. Uh, Barb then saw a chance to go up to Maine. Uh, and what year is this? It had to be in, in, in early 88. To go up to Maine where the expenses wouldn't be as much. It was real nice. Like, we went up and took a look and we, we really, really enjoyed it. Well then we put the house on it. We put the house, we had put the house on a market down slide out and it just it was not selling. We put it on the market at the just as it was going into a, de a steep decline, and we owed more in the house than we could ever get for it. This was the uh, condo in Chamonix. So 
As we moved out, we rented. We kept it rented for over 20 years after that. And, and but then now we're up in Maine. And uh, ASA goes by itself, not going to do anything. But Barb's working for uh, an environmental firm there, which later became uh, ABB, a C. Abramo Berry, which it was at one of the world's largest firms that was doing 35 billion, not million, but billion dollars a year business. And Barb was a chief scientist for environmental because the headquarters for environmental of ABB was in Portland. And it was the old organization Barbara worked for in Florida, so she just transferred over. Um, and then I saw, just for the heck of it more or less, I decided I'd apply for a job, which I saw an opening for. It was Director of Environmental Management and Planning for the Greater Portland Council of Governments. So I went down and found out, I didn't have any idea what that meant. Went and found out it was for Portland. I'd be the Environmental Manager of Portland and the surrounding 25 or 26 town. And that was, that was, that was fun. It got me into environmental, an area I probably should have been a little bit more to be technically, to become more technically proficient. But uh, I got in that, and, and one of my responses, I used to call myself, instead of the, the Director of Environmental Management and Planning for the Greater Portland Council of Governments, the, the COG, they called it. I. Uh, I was the front man for closing the garbage dumps. And at that time, the decision had been made by Maine, all the garbage dumps were to close, you know, and, and people were supposed to build transfer facilities and transfer everything to the waste, uh, waste energy facility that we just built in Portland. And um, so my job was to go out and talk, which I did. I talked to all the town, the 27 towns, some, several times. To their, to their board of, not the board of directors, to, to, I taught, would talk to the citizens. Because Maine had the law that, that only the citizens could vote for changes in law or changes in financial matters. So you'd, you'd go to the town hall meeting, and whoever was there got to vote, and the majority of the people there who were at, who were at the meeting, uh, if they voted for a bill or voted against it, that's, that's the way it went. They needed four or against it based on the people's vote. I later had them, because of me, they changed, they changed the wording a little bit. Uh, but anyway, going to, going to all, the, all the meetings were always in the dead of winter because that's when the, the, when the people who owned the largest plots of the best land in town were always either from Massachusetts or Canada. And, and in the dead of winter in February, no one goes to Maine, even Canadians won't go to Maine. And Massachusetts aren't about to drive up. So they had the meeting, so only the local Maine people would vote. And, uh, and what they would do, because I've heard many times around the round table, they would say, well, you know, hey, the property, that property down around the lake is really getting expensive these days, you know. Oh, yes, yes. And, and really, there were a lot of improvements to do, and, and we should raise taxes. Uh, the millage, uh, especially for the people around the lakes. Well, of course, who owned the property around the lakes? Well, the people from Massachusetts. But well, they weren't there to vote, and it didn't count anyway, because only the people who were at the meeting could vote. Well, how I changed that, because I would, I would talk them to death, because no one wanted to close the garbage dump, because that's where they met all their buddies, and, and the, the, the fellow citizens were down to close the, the, at the garbage dumps every Saturday or Sunday, whatever they could. Well, I talked this one little town until I, until, I, until I saw I had three votes, solid votes. And I waited until everyone either fell asleep or, in fact, they, they left the hall. You did a filibuster. I did, in essence, I did a filibuster, yes. And, and, but they weren't, but it was explaining to the nth degree and for the nth time how really a transfer facility was so good, so cheap overall, and so environmental friendly and all the other things. We got it down to there's five people in the hall that's left in the hall. I forgot the name of the town. So I knew I had the three votes. So I called for a vote. They voted three to two to transfer for some. <laughs> the next day when the people woke up that they just committed their little town to spend two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a transfer so they were gonna kill the three people who voted for it. But then what they did, they had another town hall and they couldn't change the law because the law was it was already they had already voted for it and they can't repeal it. At least not for 
until after they, they had the transfer episode. So I went to the next vote they had was to change the law. It had to be a, it had to be a quorum, had to go to the meeting or it wasn't a meeting. So I mean the, the and a quorum of the people who were in town at the time had to be there. Now the quorum, the only the majority could win. So then it would take a couple hundred votes to do something. I got three people. Right. But they changed the law, and all the other little towns followed suit. They didn't want that rascal Richard coming and pulling you up doing that thing to them again. But but they 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 all did did what they're supposed to. They closed their dumps, built a transfer facility, and and now now. What happened is, is is the Gulf War comes along, and and I see and there's a lot of call for for chemical protection equipment and things like that. And so with the ASA side, things are beginning to heat up. And I told the gang that okay, I'd been with them for a year or 15 months or whatever it was, or a year and a half, a year and a half at this time. That I really couldn't. That that I would just be going too long. And I don't think they could afford to have their director absent as much as I was going to be absent. So they said, okay. Uh, and then we, we started ASA folding up. And of course, Barbara in the meantime is becoming very senior with Asiya Brown Bavari and she's doing very well. And then Asiya Brown Bavari sells out. And eventually, uh, uh, Barbara had, had enough of, enough of the new company. I've forgotten the name of it now. But, uh, and so she left that, and we're just doing uh, ASA, ASA stuff. And it's, it's paying the bills and, and, and all the other stuff. And, and we're becoming fairly well done. Still like in the big contract, because one thing, we refuse to write contracts for the government, because it, it's too long, it's too involved, and you have to be competitive. Uh, it goes out for competition, and we always felt that we offered the best product because they don't want it. Not so. They said they don't need our product. <laughs> what was your product? Well, it was it was selling. Uh, other way, what, what we would do is assist them in anything they needed to get done. We could offer the expertise and what was required for chemical and biological protection, whether it be an air handling system, whether the chemistry of it, or the biology of it, or the medicine of it, or whatever else. We either had the expertise that we could get the expertise. Okay. And so, uh, but we but we refused to, to take to write a proposal because we had written down and down when slide out we had written several proposals that we knew were good, but it went to favorite sons and and favorite sons and favorite daughters, and, and they couldn't convince us that it was competitive. subbing to uh, like Patel, we, we, we sub to them and, and they sponsor us for several trips through Europe and, and gathering data for them, which is, and they get it for, for, for the various services. So that's how we got around doing the proposal ourselves. We let other people do the proposal and we just subcontract, subcontract to them. We had, we had some kind of subcontracts to ourselves for various shelter manufacturers and others and some uh, civilian firms that wanted us to go to Europe for them. And, and, and look around and try to make contacts with them, which we did. Uh, now, turn off just for a second. Sure. Now, okay. One is while while we're still up in Maine, and I've forgotten the exact uh, year that it happened, but now you know terrorism began to make a a big impact uh, across the arena. Where, we had started the Chemical and Biological Medical Treatment Symposium, the CBMTS series. And we started because we didn't know that you couldn't just start a meet and start an international series immediately. So we did it a little bit in the blind, but we had Battelle back us up with funding and we had this, the government of Switzerland back us up to, with funding. They asked, well, why did we get Switzerland? Well, why? Why beat our heads against the wall in the U.S.? Because it's always either not invented here or who needs it. Uh, we got other bigger people that can do it better. 
So we went to Switzerland. Switzerland liked what we had to offer and bringing all the nations together and bring it for a, pe a peaceful purpose of getting them together, exchange ideas, and all contribute. And what Switzerland said, it's got to contribute to peace. They like what we offer. We had that first meeting in 1994. But I think this was even previous to 1994. Uh, one of the meetings, I met this Israeli general someplace, and he wanted me to come to Israel. So I figured a way to do it. Well, and I go to I go to Israel, which I did, and then I'd go to Yugoslavia because another good friend of Barbara and I that we had met in the in the mid in the mid fifties was uh, I have to think of his name, but he wanted me to come visit him too. So I go to Israel, go all around. This general takes me all around, including one of their their very very classified nuclear facility, Sarek, and. Uh, uh, so go around and first uh, we go to the Ministry of Defense, which is in their Pentagon in downtown Tel Aviv. And while I'm sitting there, some other Israelis called into the office, talked to this colonel I was visiting, who wanted me to visit him. And they were telling him to get me out of the building. I had no right being in there. I'm thinking, and he's telling me what they said. And actually, the general's son who's listening to the conversation is telling me that, that they want to kick my rear end out and I shouldn't be in their Pentagon. And it's a colonel that wanted me to visit is telling him to go, in nice words, just go bug off. <laughs> that I was visiting him and that he was responsible for me. And that's about the way it was. Uh, half the people wanted me to see me, the other half wanted to throw me out of my rear end. Thought I was spying for the U.S. or something. Well, then they, they actually take me out to Sarek, the nuclear researcher, and had a meeting out there. And had a, all these characters that I met worked on the nuclear side of the business which was sort of hush-hush at the time in Israel, in fact, around the world. Uh, but I'd been there, and then, and then, of course, I wanted to go look around, so I, I took a trip. Uh, I, I took a tour of Jerusalem with a tour bus and got off the bus in Jerusalem, and then I wanted to go see this doctor that Barbara and I had met at this, at this uh, hospital in Jerusalem. And I did. He invited me over to his house, and we took a, took a short day that day. But he showed me what... How the hot was pretty neat, how the hospitals had protection in case anything happened in either Syria or somebody used chemical weapons on them, and how they would close down everything, and how the showers and how that would all work. Then we go to his house, and then and had a, a, a couple of drinks or so with him and his wife, and then I go to get a, then I go to get the taxi back to Tel Aviv. An Israeli taxi they always fit seven people inside an Israeli taxi. It's like a mini limo. And then so I ride back in the taxi, and one of the little things on there was they had a couple of young people. Cause they couldn't, they had to be very early 20s, and I thought they were married, but they're both wearing the, the very conservative Jewish costume. I forgot what you call the conservative Jews. Orthodox? Hmm? Orthodox? Orthodox, yeah. They were Orthodox Jews, but you had speaking with a, it was sort of like a Brooklyn accent, young, young people. And the cab driver who was, and they have a name for someone who's born in Israel. And he, this guy, he told me, he's telling me after, after the couple got out of the cab, halfway to Jeru halfway from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. But he's Saba or something. Uh, I've forgotten the name. But anyway, he he's one. He was born in Israel. And he did not like the Orthodox. He said he said these Orthodox. They said they're all from the states. And, and I think they are all from the States. And he said that, that they belong to Looney Tunes, they're crazy. And he said they move in the neighborhood and right away the prices go down on all, on all the real estate. Wow. And he said, you lose money with they if they move anywhere around you. And they try to close, he said, we go to, I go to a movie on Sunday and they're trying to, they're trying to close down the movie. Uh, he, said, he said the people are Sunday or Saturday, whatever, that they're seven, they're seven day. But he says, and he, and he didn't like them. And this, they got out of the, he put them out of the cab halfway, and then they had to walk across this ravine up there. He said, aren't you, they said, aren't you going to take us to our village? He said, no, get out of the cab now. This is all as far as you've been. He kicked them out. They had to walk across this open field up to, up to their village. Did not like, in fact, very few Israelis like American Orthodox Jews. And that's just the way it is. Yeah. No matter what they say. In fact, 
they talk about they talk about it turn on spit. <laughs> anyway, so that that's just a little, little bit. Now. Okay, now I go out to the airport to leave. I'm a fly. I'd flown in on Swiss Air uh, from Zurich, and I'm fly back to Zurich, in Missouri. I'm there for two hours and fly over to Belgrade. The um, I go to get on the airplane, and it, and it's, I see these three guys in plain clothes coming down the line. They come to me, pull me out of line. There's 150 people waiting in line. That's why you do it in Israel at, at the airport. You wait in line. After you got your tickets, you've been cleared and everything. You wait in line. And then you all get on, and go out and get on buses. Then you can take the airplane. So I went waiting in line, standing up, of course. They pull me out. For the next 60 minutes, the next one hour, they questioned me. Everything I'd done in it, boot up it. Luckily, I'd gotten business cards from all of them, and, uh, and I thought, well, this is who I've been. And then they wanted to know who was in the cab with me from Tel Aviv, from uh, from uh, uh, Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. And then I just, you know, I had a nervous laugh, and I said, hey, come on. I said, you know that much? If you know that much, you know who's in the cab. And they said, we don't need for you to make wise-ass answers. I said, yes, sir. And I answered the rest of their question. Okay, get back. Now, you're standing in line, and some clown gets pulled out. It had to be for a reason. And kept you standing for attention for one hour. Wow, they, oh yeah, they kept them. They all stand there until I got back in line in my place. And then we all marched on, got on a bus, and went on here. Oh my goodness. Because I'm riding way back in coach somewhere, and I'm sure all the first class passengers will go on ballistic. But uh, they couldn't. Now, so I get back to Zurich. The airplane's actually a little bit late then, but now I've still got an hour to wait for my airplane. You get on my airplane and go in to Belgrade. Now, I get questioned again for an hour. What was I doing in Tel Aviv? Why was I in Israel before I came to the great state of Yugoslavia? What did, was I, who was I working for in Israel? Was I working for what, at, whatever you call it, Intel outfit for Israel? Was I working for them? And this went on for about an hour. Now, then they finally let me go. I go down and stay at the Hilton Hotel, which they had a Hilton there. It was still commun, com, on the communism at the time. And uh, so I got there. I spent three or four days with the general, you know, we do everything. It was, it was always a lot of fun with him anyway, so I spent three or four days with him. I went around Belgrade for an hour, for a few hours. Now it's time to go back to the airport. After five or six days, to go back out to the airport. Now I get out there and I realize they had gotten my camera. Well, one thing I said, I had a voice recorder. Thank God I didn't have any voice recorder. Uh, the voice recorder, oh. This goes back to Israel. The Israeli secret police, they come in my room and I had a voice recorder. And I know I didn't have it. I had some thing I'm like, I'm looking up and this is the skyline and, and, and uh, Tel Aviv. And I'm standing on the beach. Uh, the hotel's on the beach. I'm standing at that. I'm saying how great it looked and everything else. But they took my tape and they spread it all over the bed. You know, this is the old tape, tape. Recorder. They spread the tape all over the bed. Neatly, but they spread it all over. And I think there may be a note, careful next time, or something like that. Let me know that you're not safe anywhere. So I said, oh, Jesus. Now, now I'm, in, I'm in Belgrade, you know, and they that question me there. Now I'm back out at the airport, and they took my camera. So now I lose the tape recorder, and, and uh, or the tapes and, and, and Tel Aviv, and I lose my camera in Belgrade. So I'm sitting there, fuming, and, that, and I'm in a big, that, at that time, the airport looked like a big hangar, and we did nothing. And across from me, I'm waiting to take Switzer out of here. I'm mad. I, I called the general and said, hey, they got my camera. And, oh, don't worry, I'll take it. Well, he never did. But uh, across from me is, is uh, uh, what's the airline? A Libyan airline. And of course, you don't see a Libyan airline because it was run by Gaddafi and, and they're barred from a lot of the countries. One so I, I just didn't see Libyan Airlines. And, and, um, but he, there, across me there's a whole group waiting to board Libyan Airlines. 
include what I call the bag ladies of the Mediterranean. Anytime you see an Arab lady in another country, they got bags and bags of stuff they're taking back to their country. And they have all these bags around them, of course, they wear on the, the shawls, they wear on everything else. They look totally Arab, except one guy, a young guy. He had to be in his mid 20s. Suit, tie, really looking sharp. And he's staring at me. I look at him. I know. He's a terrorist. I know. I just know he's a terrorist. We, we have like 15 seconds before we run okay. out of tape, so I'm going well, to switch it. Well, then I'm going to have to continue, because this is where... So you know this guy's a terrorist. Right. And, and, um, and he said, and look at the, the big old hangar, and the big old plane, like a hangar, it's almost totally empty, except for the living group and myself and a few other people going back to, uh, you know, the Swiss airline. And maybe another couple of airlines are waiting for. But... We sort of look at each other a couple of times, I know he's a terrorist, and, and we both get up at the same time to go to this little bar. And I mean, it's a little tiny bar, and no one's at it. So he ordered a Coke, I ordered and paid for it, and I ordered a, a glass of beer and paid for it. He went back to where he was. So we sort of looked at each other, acknowledged our presence, and that's about all we did. And I know he's, he's plotting something. I think, well, he's, he's on his way to Libya, he's not getting a hold of him. He's on his way to Libya, he could probably go get money from Gaddafi to go damage somewhere. Well, uh, I go back and have my beer and go down. Swiss Air comes in and we get on board. Now, I notice the business class section, so I go back to tourism. I'm the only person in tourism. The only person. I got a, I got a window seat about halfway back in the, in, the, in the tourist class. The only person in tourism. class. So I wait there and that plane fills up up front. No one ever comes back and back. Oh, that's strange. So then, uh, we, we pull back about 10 feet. We close the door, we pull back about 10 feet. Now, we stop. We pull forward about 10 feet. The, the gateway comes open, the door opens. So I'm looking like this, to, over the side to see who's getting on board. So I look way, way up front. Who gets on board? The young guy who was with the Libyans. I said, I don't believe this young Well, you know. Max, he's probably going to fly business anyway because he's a paid terrorist. And, uh, but he, kind of, he starts walking back. And he's also got a, so help me God, he's got an umbrella with him. So I right away, I think of the Ryzen incident, you know, where they stabbed the guy in, 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 with Ryzen and an umbrella in, in London. But he comes back, he comes in, he comes to my room. I said, oh, shh. He's probably the other side of the airplane. He comes in, but now he comes in, three seats, he comes and sits in a seat. Right next to me, I says, I've had it. Uh, so, my God, I've had it. He's gonna kill me. <laughs> we get it. So, and, and so, let me just really happen. So, being the nice guy, I said, Wow! Ah! I got up and stretched. I said, I think I'll give us a little bit of room, you know, my Like, you didn't know what this nuts doing. So, I moved over up forward part of the, of the, of the tourist class cab and on the opposite side. We take off. And 20 minutes later, we're landing again at another airport, another uh, Yugoslav airport. This time, a tourist group gets on. Where they come to the back and where they went. The only two seats that, that had been available to Belgrade were the two seats that me and the terrorists were sitting in. So now I had to go back and sit next to the guy because I was in someone else's seat. And the whole airplane filled up this time. Oh, God. As soon as we landed in the, in where I called Barbara and was relaying this. What, what your imagination can do for you. But then, after that, I was still a little bit shook, and I couldn't see anyone, except saying that I, I had a size map to see if there were terrorists in that. <laughs> no, no, I love the vignette on that. Okay, and if you turn up just for a second, I'll take a look at you. You know, and some of the things, when, you know, when we're talking, you tend to go, you know, one story will remind something else, but then, and also, I don't want to lose sight of some of the more precious moments that we had, and that uh, was was when when your mom and and your aunt Diane and Aunt Sandy were married, and and as, as an honor to us, it was all at the same church that we were married in, which was the uh, 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 past Christian Episcopal Church, and by uh, and by the minister who was, it was such a, he was a good friend, he was a really really good friend for all of us. Um, he, he actually survived the first hurricane 
Camille in 19, when was that? 59, 69, whatever it was. He survived that even though it destroyed most of the church and the, ch the Episcopal church was rebuilt. And, but he didn't survive this uh, uh, Katrina. And, uh, uh, or, or maybe he died just before that, but uh, he, he's gone now. A really, really nice show. But the weddings were all, and, and Anne had planned them, uh, because that was her pride and joy, was to see, you know, as well as mine, but her, her very specific pride and joy was to plan the wedding, get all the family to pitch in, and, and, they, and they did. And, and the wedding ball just came off like clockwork. Were very, very, very nice. And it was nice, you know. The girl, and I, and, and, and I really mean this, I know you girls are watching, but, you know, you, if ever there were stars in my life, that you girls are, as well as your daughters, and your son. And, uh, it's, you've always, you've always given me um, utmost pleasure. I just love all your pieces. I could probably say a million different stories, and you know, as we're growing up, uh, as you're growing up, as you grow up, I'm growing up too. But what a pleasure! You know, as we go forward, I wanted to talk about a couple of vignettes that that also happen, uh, and, and, and that also makes you know part of. I always felt, you know, that that I've been thrice blessed both with my daughters and, my, and with my life. What, and and some, of the, some of the things that, 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 that happened, like uh, when, I went, when, when Uncle Lionel got married, how, how this came about was uh, I was reluctant. Uh, they, they wanted me to fly General Goodpass, who was General, General Haig had come over and was taking his place. It wasn't a good one-on-one -on -one replacement because good pastor, uh, the old West Point and wanted things to go a certain way. Hank wanted to go some other, and he was a good pastor's man as all get up. But they wanted me to fly him home uh, to the U.S. Uh, well, I find, I reluctantly agreed. I did not have to take the flight, but I reluctantly agreed. Okay, I'll take it, and I made sure my schedule would match. Lionel, this is after I'd already accepted taking the flight, going into Washington, spent a few days in Washington, flying back. Well. On the way over there, would stop and say goodbye to the to the Can General Goodpass and say goodbye to the Canadian Prime Minister, who happened to be a friend of his. And we did that. We stopped up there so we could do that. Then flew down to Washington. But in the meantime, in the, in the interim period before I took the flight, even though I'd agreed to take it, uh, Lionel sent us a message that he's getting married on a certain day, and could, would it be possible for any of us to get over there? He knows it'd be almost impossible. I looked at my schedule. Of the three days I was going to be in Washington, his was the middle day. Oh. And so I got into Washington, and of course flying special air missions, where you fly all the VIPs, you were there exactly when you say you're going to be there, even if you dragged the airplane there. So, um, so sure enough, I, uh, I flew, flew into Washington, I flew down to New Orleans. There they almost had a whole airplane for me, because it was a little bit late coming in from Andrews. But flew down to Washington, went went to the wedding the next day. Uh, probably had a couple more drinks. Than I should have flew back to, to Washington and flew out the next day, to come back to Europe. So that that what, see when I, somebody looking at another one, even when when um, uh, uh, when Evan and Lisa got married, uh, I was uh, they they gave a date and. And somebody come up, I had to be in Europe and I had to be in Asia, so I decided to go around the world trip. Barbara was going to Europe with me because she had to be there, but she would come back, then she was going to fly out to San Francisco and then go up for the wedding. Uh, I said, well, I'd be, I'd probably be a couple of days late. Now this is, the timing on this was before Evan and Lisa could have known about the dates that we were flying to Europe and the dates the only dates I could stop off on the air was two days after they were already married. But they sent us a message that they hated to tell us that, and then we'd have to change plans, but something had come up and they had to delay their wedding by three days. So they, I was able to fly in the night before, so the, on schedule was the night before they got married. So then I flew into Reno and then drove down to their place and was able to make, make their wedding. 
but throughout my life, I, I, it, it just, you know, I felt somebody, somebody uh, be there a God that uh, that thing, that God has has favored me immensely and, and uh, looked out for me. Maybe it's a million and one coincidence, but it happens a million times. And, uh, so, what's going on in your life now? What's going on in my life now? Where are you going? Uh, well, what we did. As I started to mention, we, we formed a chemical, biological, medical treatment symposium, both with the help of, of Patel and with the, with the government of Switzerland. From the very first meeting of that, we're, we're now coming up on our 14th meeting in that series. From the very first meeting, it was considered a success. Now, we do not hold a meeting unless it's, it's under the auspices of the government wherever we hold a meeting. So we've had our president of Egypt, it was, uh, he sponsored our, our meeting one time personally. We stayed at his son's hotel in Cairo. In fact, that was a little bit of coincidence there. That was that was less than 10 days after the Luxor tragedy where the, the terrorists had killed uh, 70 of the, um, of, of the tourists that were down there, uh, primarily Swedish tourists because that turns out to be the plaza that unloaded. But they, uh, they killed 70 at that time. And only, and, and then we had, the government of Egypt called us and said, you're not gonna cancel out on us. Everyone else had, you know, kicking us right in the teeth. And we said, no, I said, don't worry. I said, we'll come with whoever wants to come to the meeting. We had only one country canceled, and that was Sweden, I didn't blame them. And, but all the other countries showed up at the meeting. We were the only people, we were the only people in, uh, in Cairo uh, for not only for the meeting, but with only people in Cairo that, that were tourists. Uh, no one, in fact, the, the pyramids were closed. We we got to go out because we were, you know, the president himself had sponsored it. So he made sure that we got out to the to the uh, uh, pyramids and, and all the other sites. We go in the Egyptian Museum, which is so famous, and and normally the crowds go around the blocks to get into it. We just and they just had to walk in and see everything in the, in the mm. Egyptian Museum. And all of the famous sarcophagus and all the all the other things, you know. And um, that meeting went in Egypt went real well. According to the Egyptians, we had attracted more Arabian countries and more Muslim countries than any meeting they'd ever had, including all their own Arab meetings. Uh, we had we had attracted more countries than any, any of them ever had to this meeting. Went 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 real well. Some Egyptians do things a little bit different, but they're really funny about it. And uh, like uh, the guy who helped me put it together, he decides he, it's, it's nap time for him. I'm trying to run a meeting, and he decides it's nap time for him every even afternoon at two o'clock or something like that. I, I told him one time, I felt like wringing his neck. But um, but uh, and we know that he was pocketing a lot of a lot of the funds. Uh, we, we we took so many so many riverboat so many boat rides on the Nile, we felt we owned the Nile after a while because we, I think we, I think his in-laws ran the boat line that we were, we were on it so many times. But once again, it, it's part of the experience and, and it, was, it was fun. Uh, the meetings have all been, well, we, we have over today, we have over 80 countries that are members of our, of our, uh, of our series. We have over 2,500 professionals and our professionals average uh, PhD plus. And uh, you know, they're either, oh man, the guy almost schwacked us. But uh, uh, like I said, we have to, they're, they're, they're real professional and they're real fun to be with. They, they enjoy each other, they enjoy being together as a group. The work they do is outstanding. We have some funny things that happen now. We had this one guy, uh, uh, Ivan. Uh, Yvonne is all I can remember right now, but he was the manager of the most star chemical production facility, chemical weapon production facility in Yugoslavia. And this is when it was all, no one ever knew that they were actually producing chemical weapons. And we were the first, ASA was the first one to get the knowledge, but now we got the knowledge, we got the, uh, we got the very specifics on, on, on the, uh, on how much they produce, when they produce it, how they produce it, why they produce it, where it was stored, and everything else. 
So we got all that information. That was in the all became part of the ASA newsletter, part of the lore of the ASA newsletter. We always seem to be a few steps ahead of everyone else. I'd gone into Croatia in 19 uh, in the summer of 1990. The war had started in the fall of '89. And I was there in the summer of 90, so the, the war is still going on, was still going on for several more years. Uh, I was the only one that had a voice, which was the ASA newsletter, uh, that actually spoke for Croatia. And, and now, here I've been in Yugoslavia many times, but what I saw the Serbs doing was wrong. There was not one shot, not one shot had been fired in Serbia. All the shots were fired in either Bosnia or Slavonia or in Bosnia or in Croatia. And the Serbs were saying how they were being picked on. No, they were, the United Nations and the US and Germany had already recognized Croatia as a sovereign nation. And Serbia is still in there, or Yugoslavia and forces are still in there shooting up the, the Croatians and complaining that, that, that they're, they're being wronged. I said, this, this wasn't right, so I sided with Croatia. You can go through the news there and see all the times when I did this. And all the people I got over there. Well, I got to be a favor with the Croatians because I was doing this. And and uh, Joe Bobetko, who was the commander, actually when I first met him, I'd gone down to uh, Dubrovnik. At that time, it took about 10 hours out of split to get down there, which is no more than it's like a three and a half hour ride now. But we had to go 10 miles, and wait for permission to go another 10 miles. And, and, and you'd see fires burning from recent artillery duels and things like that. Uh, Jim Bobetko told his gang to go through, they had captured the old headquarters for Yugoslavia and for me, for them to go through the headquarters with me, open up every safe, see if they had anything to do with chemical, biological weapons or anything in that area and make sure that it was translated for me. And they did. And you'll see a lot of the results of that uh, in, in the ASA newsletter. And one of the things that happened right off, in fact, from that first meeting, uh, this general uh, is also a, a great scientist. He invented HI6 as a prophylaxis uh, for chemical uh, chemicals for nerve gas. Uh, I can't think of it. He's also a professor at the University of Zagreb. Uh, he he really liked me. But uh, let's see, was that one the one thing? Oh, he wanted me to go be interviewed by Croatian TV. Well, you got to imagine Zagreb TV. Sarajevo TV and Belgrade TV are like three peas in a pod. They, they, you, they're on different channels, and you listen to all three channels all over the Yugoslav Peninsula, or all over Yugoslavia at that time, and ex-Yugoslavia. So, so they have the newscast. They asked me in English, and they, they converted the English to Croatian. Asked me how would I stop the war, and what I told them exactly what I said. I, you know, I can't remember the exact words, but what I said. NATO did exactly three years later, exactly. Had, had a, they done it when I said it, of course it would have saved over 200,000 lives. Mm -hmm. But if you can imagine, what would the American ambassador be doing listening to Croatian TV at six o'clock in the morning? But he was. So we're I'm back a week or two weeks, something like that, and got a call from the American embassy, not the American embassy, the State Department. And uh, are they actually, they had a person call me and talk to me and say that uh, from state. And what was I doing trying to set American policy? Well, then the guy, I'm sure the guy's ears got real red because I read him the riot act. And I'll say what I want, when I want, where I want, how I want, and why I want. And what I said was, well, I mean, what, there was no, I didn't say it was going to be American policy. I was asking a question, well, what would I do? And I said, this is what I would do. They said, well, it sounded like you would. You're an American, and you're saying what should be done. That's American policy. I said, no, it isn't. I hung up on him. That was the first of two times they were going to call me. Uh, another time, myself and Brian Davey, who was uh, now the chief of, 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 of health for the Organization for Prevention of Chemical Weapons, and he's visited the family up in Maine and everything else. He and his wife and the kids. Real good friend from South Africa. He was in South Africa at the time. And we're trying to think of a nom de plume to use for stories in the ASA newsletter. And so we get it from different sources and we don't have to say whose name it was in case of what they wanted. And it also got to be a fun thing with us. 
and we, we picked Reginald Bartholomew. And we figured anyone with a name like that would have to fight their way out of a bar. And then we're laughing at him. You know, he's in South Africa. And I'm up here in, in Maine. Uh, so we named him. We printed several articles. Another call from the State Department. And this time they're, they're furious. They didn't give Reginald Bartholomew permission to write for the ASA newsletter of all things. What are you talking about? Well, we've been reading his articles. And even though some are pretty good, to be honest. We did not, he has to have our permission before he can write for you. I'm like, Benjamin, we made up this thing? What are you talking about? Well, Ambassador, we're going to talk to Ambassador Bartholomew. And I said, look, the name's made up. Please. Well, he shouldn't be writing for you. And we said, it is not his writing. Then I get a call from the World Affairs Council of Maine. They want me to invite Reginald Bartholomew up to speak to them at a morning breakfast, and they will pay for all of his expenses. I said, Jesus, what is happening? I don't believe this. Just because we made up this name, I'm getting called to the state now, the World Affairs Council wants. I said, you know, I really can't write. I said, yes, you can. He's been writing for you. I said, I really can't. I said, why do you want him to him anyway? Can't you get out of it? He said, no. He graduated from Portland High School. Uh. I said, I don't believe this. Sure enough, he did. And he was an American ambassador. Mm. And I have to stop it there because it ran out of time.